Well, it is Mother's Day weekend. And um, for those of you who are joining a little late, I'm having some internet connectivity problems down here at my parents' house. So we've determined that it's better with my video off. Um, there's less delay and lag. So um, you know, I will show you my background before I pop off at the very end of the service. I am going to um, leave here and go sing at my parents' church with my one of my best friends from high school. Um, their service starts at 10 our time. So, um, And I do apologize in advance for any noise you hear in the back. My brother will be coming through at some point to head to the showers and who knows what else you might hear. Um, there might even be a grocery delivery while I'm sitting here. Um, so I'm, I'm getting the full experience of what it's like to do remote church with a family in tow. So that's very exciting. Next slide, please. <clears throat> it is good to have everybody here and happy Mother's Day to everyone who is a mother, has been a mother figure to anybody or who has a mother. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that means in the service later today. And yes, I am from coming to you from Texas. I made it um, by the grace of God and a delayed flight out of Dallas. I was able to make it here with my luggage on the proper day and only in the end half an hour late. So um, that was pretty good. Um, and everybody here is fine. They all send their love. Hopefully next week my dad will feel like being on. He's a little exhausted today so he's sitting in the other room watching a nascar race on tape <laughs> he'll, i'm sure i'll hear it fast forward to the wreck pretty soon so all right stick you're up okay everybody once again i'm pushing to get people to come down and volunteer tomorrow night uh at 5 30 uh we got a lot done last week we had a great crew though a small crew uh we still have work to do tomorrow night inside. We're going to be cleaning out the freezer, which is absolutely disgusting. Uh, the refrigerator needs a little TLC. Uh, I've got some fertilizer that we can spread on the lawns and some grass seed. So there's plenty for everybody to do. If somebody doesn't feel like they can do the work, if they want to drop off a little something for, for supper, we have some cold cuts. We had frozen from last week and some rolls. Uh, but we could use a little more cold cuts maybe or a little something for supper. And uh, I think we have enough water. So uh, like I say, we're going to be doing this every Monday night for the month. So there's plenty to do. So hope to see you all. Thank you. And our Savers clothing drive is still going strong. Yeah, I can't um, get some. You can... Yeah. Um, drop stuff off on Monday evenings between 5.30 and 7, or uh, Emma will update when she'll be in the office, and then when I'm back, I'll have office hours fairly regularly as well. And the 29th, which is um, the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend, there's a community drop-off day. So spread the word to your neighbors, let them know. Um, it is clothing and household textiles, so um, no furniture, but um, that covers a pretty wide swath of things that, at least in my house, I have an abundance of. So we hope to make good use of that with a fun drive. We added a couple of slides on. Emma's going, where did this come from? Yeah, I added it. Um, while I'm on soup, um, soup kitchen, I believe for, is on Tuesday. Um, I had rolls in water, but I think the facilities have actually grabbed those, uh, the, the rolls um, since I started working this morning. Um, so I think we are just about all set. We could always use a little bit more with the um, bottles of water. Uh, Ann Farrell will be uh, heading it up this time. So, um, you know, get in touch with her if there's anything else. Ab, did you want to do the soup and sock? Yeah. So. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe you all remember, I hosted a soup and sock drive at the church, and, like with help from the NHS at my school. We collected 970 total donations and almost 50 of which were from our church community. So woohoo, we did an awesome job helping out and they got 
donated to a bunch of local things like the food pantry, the crossroads of Rhode Island, community care lines, and love from above. So awesome job. Thank you, everybody. Woo, very cool. Way to go, Abby. Mm -hmm. Um, I also threw this on here. Um, this is going to start getting shared around town. You're going to see it. Um, like last year, they are doing a graduation parade through town for the um, class of 2021 graduates from Mansfield High School. So mark your calendar, June 5th. The time did move to two o'clock. If you had heard about it earlier, it had been three, but it's now two. You can see the route. Don't try to follow that map. It's basically the high school down East Street, down Main Street. If you're gonna come out, that's where you wanna be somewhere along East or Main um, to see them do their little loop through town. Cool. It's exciting that graduations are, are happening for folks. We have a couple of graduations among the congregation uh, children and grandchildren next weekend. And we're very happy about that. Um, and we'll celebrate those um, next week as uh, in our prayers. For now, let us take a deep breath and center our hearts and minds on our worship as we hear the centering music. Let us pray our opening prayer together. Great shepherd, I don't wanna be a goat. I want to be a sheep. I want to be your child all the time for all time. Mother me with your love always. So I will see my brother Jesus in the face of every person who asks for food or drink, for clothing or a visit and know you better as your child. Amen. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you. 
This is another one of the songs that I have taught many, many times. And I think this is one that I actually learned as a child in um, vacation Bible school along the way. And this song is from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 12. And it goes with the rest of today's reading because today's gospel reading is about how we can best love each other and how we can best love our neighbors. So Jesus gave this commandment that you love one another to his disciples at the Last Supper. And it's something that if we remember and we live, then our beloved community is very strong. This one doesn't have motion, so I'm not going to try to turn my camera on, but it goes like this. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. That your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And if you want to dance, bop around, clap to it, you can do that too. But hopefully everybody will sing along. Um, and it'll be really nice to pull these out again when we're all together and maybe learn them and sing them all at a full voice back in the sanctuary someday. Maybe soon. Wouldn't that be lovely? This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, that your joy may be full, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And I hope that as our children are hearing this and as you are sharing it, hopefully with the children in the congregation, that we'll remember that the kind of love that Jesus had for us was a love that would take care of us in every way and a love that would literally sacrifice itself for us, that we might understand just exactly how much God loves us and how much God created us to be loved and to love each other. Let's sing it one more time. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, that your joy may be full, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. I think that's a great prayer too. This is my commandment, Jesus said, that you love one another as I have loved you. And may we remember this and may God give us strength to love each other as Jesus loved us. Amen. And our scripture lesson comes from the gospel of Matthew chapter 31 verses or chapter 25 verses 31 through 46. And this is the last parable in the Gospel of Matthew before the story of Holy Week begins. So this is the last parable that Jesus taught his, um, or before the, the, sorry, before the last events, before um, the Last Supper. So this is the last parable that Jesus taught his um, followers before he was uh, arrested and put on trial. 
And we can imagine that he was teaching this on the temple porch. So he would have been teaching this to not just his own disciples, but to the wider community. Anybody who was there for Passover would have been listening to this. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's also important for us to remember that um, Matthew was written to an audience that was primarily Jewish and probably all Jewish at a time when um, they were still trying to figure out how to be good followers of Jesus after the temple um, had been destroyed. Then I'll say a little bit more about that in the sermon itself. So hear these words from scripture and hear this passage with new ears if you can. When the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Here ends the reading of our scripture this morning. So this passage um, is shocking in many ways because it is direct evidence of condemnation for not doing the right thing. It's direct evidence of people who don't behave properly, not receiving some kind of eternal reward. And it's also direct evidence that one does not have to be, in the case of Matthew's community, Jewish in order to receive eternal life. Because where Matthew uses the phrase, the nations, He's really talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about non-believers. And you have to imagine that for Matthew's community, worshiping together 10 or 15 years after the destruction of the temple, someplace where perhaps it was hard to be Jewish as it was, for them to hear this parable from the memories of those who had been with Jesus and to hear that the Gentiles could also be saved because of course it was Gentiles in the form of the Romans who destroyed the temple. 
So you got to think that they were really kind of put out by this. No, what do you mean somebody else is going to get to be in heaven with me? I thought that was what Jesus promised me. What do you mean these other people who haven't been persecuted, who haven't had their temple destroyed, who haven't lived through the destruction of their city are going to get to be in heaven? That's just not right. Unfortunately, all too often in Christian history, this has also been seen as um, a way of separating out only Christians, because of course, when we translate the nations as Gentiles, we know that by you know, 130 AD or so, the vast majority of Christians were Gentiles. And so um, it could easily be read as the Christians who were the sheep and everybody else who was the goats. Um, and there's some pretty interesting thinking behind that. Um, goats in the theology of Judaism are unclean animals. They're scavengers. So you never know what they've been eating and you never therefore know if their meat is pure, if they're healthy, if it's safe to eat the goat meat. Sheep, on the other hand, are clean animals. They're usually kept by shepherds. And so the shepherd is well aware of where they have been and their meat's considered safe. Plus you get their wool and other products from sheep. So everybody wants to be a sheep. And in Christian history, this passage has been used as kind of a way of attracting people to say, sure, you can be a good person, you know, but if you're, you got to be a sheep to get into heaven. And it became a sense of only Christians could be good people. Well, we know differently. You know, our work as the beloved community is to be sheep. You know, we are called to feed the hungry, give drinks to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit people who are sick and imprisoned for sure. And we do that. And we do that very well. Um, the love and care that you show each other, even through the pandemic when visiting hasn't been um, safe to do, you've kept each other um, through cards and phone calls and video chats and time on coffee hour. We've found ways to visit people um, when we couldn't physically be with them. And one of the things that strikes me that a lot of churches don't do is within their own beloved community is to work with the imprisoned. That's a very, very hard thing to do um, because of security restrictions and because of um, just the layers of bureaucracy that, that have to happen. But there are ways to work with the imprisoned that don't involve going to visit people in prison. And one of the things that I have become acutely aware of in the last several years is the number of families in our in communities all around the country who are affected because a member of the family is imprisoned. Um, might be a father, a brother, a son, um, someone is in the prison system and they could be actually imprisoned or they could be on probation or parole, but that impacts the entire family. And so I don't know what's available. I don't know how um, we might go about this, but it strikes me that there might be a group of people in the Mansfield area who are in need of a caring, loving, supporting community that will not judge the entire family based on the actions of one person in the family. And if there's any church in the area that I think could do that, it's this congregation. So I wonder if there's a mission opportunity there. I wonder if that's another piece of reaching out to build networks and to build bridges so that people who feel as though they're on the outside can actually 
come into a community that's going to love and support them and that recognizes that um, the deeds of one person doesn't have to define the entire family. Um, there's also a lot of mental health care needs that go along with uh, people who either have been imprisoned or people with um, family members who are imprisoned. And so that's another way that I think this community, this beloved community called the Congregational Church of Mansfield is uniquely situated to perhaps reach out to folks that um, have been left out in many ways. It's easy for us to think, well, we do all these things, we can rest on our laurels, we already know we're sheep, ba 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 ba. But I wonder what else there is. I wonder how much more there is for us to think about and how many more people we might reach over the years if we keep our eyes and ears open for other partnerships. Now, the food pantry is doing such an amazing job. They're working on some uh, permanent storage solutions. They're working to make sure that they're taking care of the needs of the community that is coming to the food pantry. Um, and Dick, I'm gonna tell on you here, um, that there's a Muslim population in town, as many of you are aware, and some of them are clients, uh, guests of the food pantry. And so knowing and understanding what halal food is, has become important to the food pantry so that they can make sure that the dietary needs of our Muslim neighbors are being taken care of. Not every food pantry takes that opportunity. Not every group of people would care deeply enough to make sure that people who are observing another religion would be able to follow their dietary laws. And I commend the food pantry for being aware of that and for asking those questions. Um, because it would be easy to just think, you know, well, take it or leave it, you know, we're, we're here. And if you need the food, take the food, you know, why are you worried about following your dietary laws? The dietary laws are important, just as people who keep kosher have dietary laws to follow. That's the mark of a beloved community that understands what it means to love others as Christ has loved them, has loved us. And so I commend that to you. Um, as we're thinking about savers and that kind of thing, you know, we're collecting clothing and that kind of thing for savers. And that may be our best option. That may be the way that we can best support clothing people who need to be clothed. We're not in a position to have a, a clothing shop or a um, rummage shop or anything like that. But down the road, who knows? Who knows what possibilities may pop up? And then, of course, there's the bigger picture altogether, which is, wouldn't it be amazing to build a community, an entire community, where everyone has enough and there's never a need for a food pantry? Wouldn't it be amazing to build a community where clothing people is never a problem because everyone has enough to get the clothing that they need? Winter clothing, summer clothing, clothing for any activity. Wouldn't it be amazing to live in a world where nobody has to worry about clean water? We're incredibly blessed in this area to have good clean water. I'm sitting here in Corpus Christi, Texas. They've made the national news at least three times in the last five years because of problems with their water system. They've been under boil water orders. You now, my parents have uh, bottled water here coming out the wazoo because that's what they use for coffee and that kind of thing. Although they do use city water for ice. It's not quite so bad once it's frozen but they always have the bottled water because you never know when the boiled water orders are gonna come. 
how do we make sure that everyone has access to clean water? How do we stop taking for granted what we have and start looking at places like Flint, Michigan, which hasn't had clean water for over seven years? Um, you know, we have all these programs where people can support creating wells in Africa um, in villages where it's desperately needed so that women don't have to carry water from river three to five, rivers three to five miles away. What's wrong with us as a society that clean water is an issue? You know, how do we take the next step of making sure that these things happen? Um, I don't have answers. I just have the questions. And as we work through possibilities for uh, new growth, for new ideas, for building networks that will connect people to the congregation and to the church, these are questions that you know might come up in conversation. And who knows who might be attracted because we're asking these questions. But the work of the beloved community is to not worry about who God is going to call sheep and who God is going to call goats. The work of the beloved community is to always be working to be sheep. We're going to fail sometimes. It's going to be okay because God is going to love us anyway. That's the whole point of loving each other as God has loved us. But as we continue to live in this 21st century, let us open our eyes and our hearts to the possibility that there's more yet to be done and that there are people waiting to do this work with us if we just have the courage and the insight to ask these questions around the right people. And it might take 25 conversations. It might take two. You never know. But the beloved community is out there and it isn't just Christians. There are a lot of people of every faith and no faith at all who belong to the beloved community and who want to do these things to make sure that everyone has food and clean water and clothing and someone to care for them when they're sick or imprisoned. Let us find those people and build the beloved community even bigger. Alleluia, amen. I'm going to invite you all, um, as you're able, to include in the chat the names of people who have been like mothers to you um, over the course of your lives. They may be the mothers who raised you. They may be um, aunts who were particularly influential. They may be teachers or youth leaders or other people. Those who gave you a sense of security and hope and who upheld you through difficult times and celebrated you in the best times of your life. So I do invite you to do that in the chat as we continue to pray. For the whole world, as we continue to process grief, our personal grief, our pan community grief, and both, and we hold out the hope that light is beckoning us out of this pandemic time. We continue to pray for um, those who have been affected by extreme natural events. You may have seen some of the snowstorms out in Colorado this week. There's been more tornadoes. Um, there's been huge hailstones uh, in some places that have done some pretty big damage. And the volcano on St. Vincent is still active, although no, not quite as active as it has been. We are praying for those who are living with mental or physical illness, for those who are or will be recovering from surgery, and for caregivers of every kind. Um, 
and we're excited that Gabe Ironman is on the call today um, after his surgery on May 6th. And we pray, Gabe, that your recovery will continue to be easy and that um, you and your family will uh, be able to take, take on all of your normal activities in a safe and quick time. And as college and graduate school graduates are approaching the ends of their programs, um, we pray for them and their families. And we know last minute decisions are still being made about ceremonies and celebrations. And we hold all who are responsible for making wise decisions about employees and volunteers uh, in our prayers because it's getting a little easier to make good decisions, but still in some places um, worrisome with uh, variants vying with uh, immunity for those who've been vaccinated. And we give thanks for vaccines and for all those who participated in the making of them, those who are continuing to research them for safety, especially among our young people. Um, and for those who give them and we give thanks for everyone who can get them and has done so. We're very thankful for that. We pray for our country and the world as we work diligently to dismantle white supremacy and colonialism, especially the continuing legacy of systemic injustices that sustain societal inequality and inequity. And that comes from the, um, <clears throat> sorry, that comes from the annual meeting yesterday of the Southern New England Conference, which uh, was uh, very interesting and uh, be very interesting to partner with churches in Connecticut, uh, particularly because many of those many of the churches in Connecticut have been working, uh, partnering with churches from other denominations for uh, racial justice in particular for a while. So we have much to learn from our partner churches in Connecticut. And we pray for all who seek to build beloved communities, whether churches or synagogues or temples, families or neighborhood or entire towns. Sam and Alan heard from Tyler, their grandson in Afghanistan, who's still um, in quarantine after his travel, but will be out in about three days. He arrived safely and we're glad for that. And we do continue to hold in prayer those who are victims of victims and survivors of uh, gun violence in our thoughts and prayers. And we have prayers for Penny Ingram uh, as a mother figure, basketball coach in high school, Coach Christy and Aunt Dawn, Aunt Ion and Aunt Glady, uh, the welcome, lady, welcome wagon ladies of the past in Mansfield. Um, I will lift up my own mother plus um, Mrs. Milby from my fifth and sixth grade Sunday school, uh, whom you have heard about quite a bit. And then um, Carolyn from the church in Brookline where I was an in-care student and several people from various churches who have adopted me for various reasons as I have served the churches. And so I'm thankful for all of them. Are there other prayers to be shared this morning? Then I'm going to use a prayer that came from a prayer that was said on the floor of Oh dear, what did I do with that? Oh, there we go. Um, a prayer that was said on the prayer on the floor of the legislature here in Texas back in March. You may have heard about it. Um, the gentleman who prayed it was Representative James Tallarico, um, and he was um, castigated by people here in Texas for praying it. And you might understand why, although I think um, we would also say that this is a beautiful prayer. 
So let us pray. Holy mystery, you have so many names. The Torah calls you creator. The Quran calls you peace. The Gita calls you destroyer. The Dharma calls you truth. And the first epistle of John calls you perhaps the most beautiful name of all, love. You are the strange love uniting all things. The love that drew elements together after that big bang. The love that drew life itself from those primordial oceans. The love that drew us all to this exact moment. The love we were born of, the love we exist in, and the love we will one day return to. In our faith, you expressed yourself through a barefoot rabbi who embodied your perfect love, a crucified carpenter who gave only two commandments, love God and love neighbor, because there is no love of God without love of neighbor. Help us love not just in word, but in action. Help us honor not just the name of Jesus, but the way of Jesus. Help us free the oppressed, feed the hungry, house the homeless, heal the sick, release the stranger, release the prisoner, welcome the stranger, forgive the enemy, and above all, protect your creation. The word of God is love. Let us not be hearers of your word alone, but doers of your word in our families, in our communities, and in this chamber in this church, not just with prayers, but with policies and with actions, not just with personal love, but congregational love. Because our congregation is not just a social club. Our congregation is a living example of the covenant we have with every person on earth, because you made us in love. Holy mystery, open our minds, open our hearts, Open our hands so that we may build a new world in the shell of the old, a world that is more just, more free, more whole, and more in love with you. In all your many names we pray. Amen.
Let us bless each other for this week. Go on your way in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help and cheer the sick. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. Be well, be safe, be strong. And may the blessing of God be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.